Welcome to another Quick Queries video brought to you by AccessLearningZone.com. I am Richard Rost. Quick Queries is me answering all of the questions that I get via YouTube comments or posts on my forums or emails or whatever that don't necessarily need a full video on their own. So I gather them all up and we talk about them here. This is number eight. So if you like this, there's seven before this. You'll find links down below. First question comes from Jack. Jack says, I recently inherited a database from my predecessor and it's a mess. There's close to 100 tables and well over 200 queries. Is this normal and what should I do about it? Well, first of all, Jack, if all of those tables and queries serve a purpose, then there's nothing wrong with that. I've built some pretty monstrous databases myself in the past. And, you know, as long as all of those tables have a purpose and they're all in use and they're all properly normalized and the relationships are good, then that's OK. I would go through them and just make sure they're all set up properly and that, you know, they're, they're they got proper relationships and stuff between them. And that's just something that you have to just have the experience to know how to do. I got several videos on relationships. I'll put a link down below. Also, go watch my normalization video. It teaches you how to make sure the right stuff's in the right tables. A lot of times when I see people with tons and tons of tables, they're putting stuff in multiple tables that really should just be in one. So watch out for that. You know, customer address all over the place. Another thing I like to do is I like to use a helper table. And what that basically is, is let's say you've got lots of little tables that have tiny lists in them, right? A list of genders, a list of states, a list of cities, you know, all of those different tables, usually they have maybe a handful or a couple dozen records in them, maybe 50, 60 records, right? Um, you can consolidate all of those into one big table. So you don't have 50 tables. You can put all that stuff into one table. I call it a helper table. And I got a video that explains how to do that, too. I use this a lot. Now, as far as all those queries go, yeah, I try to reduce the amount of queries that I have in my database, especially ones that I'm calling from VB code by writing SQL statements for them. So if you got a real simple query that's just doing like a, a simple select statement or whatever, or even some action queries, append queries, update queries, if you can move those into VBA code, like if you're running them from a button, that will eliminate some of the mess too. But be very careful when you're deleting these objects because, uh, you know, you, uh, you might delete something you need. So make sure you back up your database first, right? Back up your database. Very important before you start messing with stuff. Jim wants to know how to fix some, it looks like a conditional formatting problem. He says, I've got a form uh, that is a paid option combo box. Okay, so you got a combo box. I'm trying to set yes to green, no to red. You got your conditional formatting set up there. After the rules, when I open the form and navigate through the records, there's no color change. Now, the question is, if you're using a combo box, is it a value list combo box where you have the words, the text in there of the words yes and no, or is it a bound combo box, a, a relational combo box where you've got the values yes and no in there? Because remember, in access, yes is negative one and no is zero. So if that's the case, you have to set your conditional formatting to look for zero and negative one or zero and not zero, I like, because some other database systems like SQL Server use one for true. So that's probably your problem. You're probably confusing text with the actual true false values. So look for that. Next up, we've got Simone asking how to copy nested tables. In other words, to copy a project with all of the stuff underneath it. All right, so you got like project one, it's got a sheet, it's got elements, it's got all this stuff underneath it. Unfortunately, Simone, there's no easy way to do this. This involves a little bit of programming, actually a lot of programming, and something called a record set. I do cover this in my Access Developer Level 24 class. The example that I use is copying an order, right? You have to copy the order record and then all of its detail items underneath that. And we'll use two record sets to loop through the items and copy them over to another record. This lesson's about two hours long. I spend a good hour of that lesson just covering copying in order with the details. And uh, I wish there was an easy way to do it aside from manually copying and pasting stuff. If you want to do it with code with like one button click, it involves some programming. So there you go. Meslian asks, how do you calculate the difference between two rows in Access? Now remember in Access, we call them records, all right? Rows is an Excel term. Uh, the difference between two cells of the same column. Okay, I get what you mean. For example, the difference in salary between two workers. Well, first of all, you're going to need a way to select which two workers you're talking about. 
So I would do this on a form. I would make two fields where you can pick the employee from a combo box. And then once you've got that employee ID in each combo box, use a DLOOKUP statement and have another text box next to that combo box where you DLOOKUP their salary from the employee table or wherever you have it stored. And then once you've got that done, then it's easy to subtract the two. So that's how I would do it. Uh, learn DLOOKUP. There's DLOOKUP. That looks up a specific record from a table. Now, if you want to do a whole bunch of records, like you want to add up a bunch of records, you can use DSUM. You can use there's D average. All the D functions are called domain aggregate functions. In other words, you can use them to perform calculations on multiple records in the same table. So there you go. Next up is Blake, and Blake is referring to a video that I posted last year for my April Fool's joke. It's called Access on Almost Any Platform, and in that video, I joke that we've got a tool available that'll let you run an access database on your Mac, on your watch, on your tablet, you know, even on your old, I don't know, Atari 2600, whatever. It was a joke. Most, I'd say 90% of people took it in stride, but a few of you were a little hurt that, you know, I posted something like that. Um, I'll, I'll keep this year's April Fool's joke a little more um, lighthearted and sensitive. <laughs> However, and I do mention this at the end of the April Fool's joke video, there is a way that you can run access on several different platforms. For example, if you want your database on your Android phone or your Mac or whatever, there's always different alternatives. And I cover a lot of those alternatives in this video. Uh, for example, one of my favorite services is Access Database Cloud, where they will run your Access Database in a virtual PC. And what that means is you can connect to it from another PC, from your Mac, from your Android phone, your iPhone, whatever, and you'll see the screen that your Access Database is displaying right over the web, right on your device. And you can lay out your forms and stuff to fit the profile of that device. So there's lots of different ways you can do this. Uh, you could put your database in SQL Server and then build a web platform for it. There's tons of tons of different ways you can get your databases online. So check this video out. All right, next up, David says, uh, I talk about getting past the two gigabyte file size limit in my split database video by stringing together tables that have a two gigabyte max file size. How do you do that? I'd like to put our agency into an access database for all of our clients. However, we have a ton of old information that needs to be scanned and stored in the database. I'm sure we're going to easily go over the two gigabyte limit. Okay, a couple of different things to unpack here. First of all, if you're talking about different tables, you can put each table in its own ACCDB file, provided that each one of those tables is less than two gigabytes. So for me, for example, I've got my customers are in one table because that's like a gigabyte and a half, right? Uh, orders are in another table. That's again, like just about two gigabytes, okay? Order details can go in a different table. So you can have multiple different uh, tables that are attached to your main front end database. Now, if you're dealing with one single large table, like let's say you've got more than two gigabytes of orders, well, then you could start talking about archiving your data, taking the oldest records and not deleting them completely, but you might not need stuff that's 10 years old. You still want to save it, of course, but you don't need it in your main database. You're done running reports on it, you don't have to look stuff up that often. So you can archive that into an, like an order backup table. All right, I'll show you how to do that in this video. Like contacts, for example, if you don't care about contacts that are 15 years old, just archive them into an old table. You'll still have them if you need to go back and look for them later, or you can have your, your, you know, your form put a message on the bottom like I do there that says, you know, you've got archived contacts, do you wanna see them? So that's another thing you could do. But the big thing I wanna mention from your question here is, you said you want to scan and store the information in the database. We do not store files or images inside our databases. That's a big no-no. Yes, I know Access has an OLE object. It has an attachment data type. You're not allowed to use them if you're learning from me. <laughs> okay, stay away from them. Do not put files in your database. Images, pictures, documents, all that stuff. I show you how to properly handle images in my images video. You're going to basically, you know, you could scan your documents, whatever, save them as images, put them in a folder, in a specific folder that your database has access to, either under the database folder or on the server somewhere else in a different share. 
then you're going to save that file name in the database only, not the file itself. And unless you've got lots and lots and lots of images, then you should be fine. As far as other document types go, you can work with those as well. I talk more about that in this video. So split your database. You could put multiple tables and multiple files. If you got one big table, you can break it up and archive those records. Don't store images and files in your database. And of course, once you finally do outgrow access, as I did a couple of years ago from my backend, uh, you can always upgrade to SQL Server. So if you've got gigabytes and gigabytes of stuff and you want to store it in your database, well, SQL Server can handle uh, big data needs on the back end, and it's more secure than Access is. You don't need it. You don't need it. I went 20 years without having to use SQL Server, so you'll be fine, but just keep in mind it's available for the future. Next up, Arthur says, I like your videos, but I've got a problem. The syntax of dmin functions is with semicolons. All right. One thing that I have to admit is that I know absolutely nothing about the different regional settings for different countries around the world. And I get questions like this asked all the time uh, in email and in the forums. You know, you're trying to use dlookup or dmin and your functions based on your regional settings for your country might use semicolons instead of commas like I show. That's something you just got to figure out. I don't know anything about it. I'll be honest. I haven't looked into it at all. One of the reasons I switched everything I do over to the ISO date format, which is year, month, day, is so that it's the same for everybody around the world. All right, because before I used to do like my date seminar and stuff, I'd do date lessons. And here in the U.S., we're, you know, uh, you know, 10, 23, 72, October 23rd, we're month, day, whereas most of the world is day, month, year, which does make more sense. But this makes the most sense, especially for a computer sorting it you know, year, month, day. So that's why I switched everything I do to this. The problem you're having, Arthur, is a regional settings problem. And without seeing exactly what you got there, I really can't give you more help, but that's probably, that's probably what it is. It's a regional thing. So not sure what you mean about the timestamp, though. That shouldn't change as long as you're giving it a valid date time field. Okay, folks, that's about going to do it for quick queries today. I know it's a short one. Uh, I'm still getting over moving, I'm unpacking, I'm living out of boxes, so I'm still trying to get my office settled. And um, this morning, I was going to do more this morning, I, I finished those other ones last night, but uh, I sat down at my desk, turned my computer on, and uh, just kept flashing, flashing white, flashing, flashing, flashing. So I did a bunch of Google-ish stuff, and nothing seemed to work, so I ended up having to roll back um the last windows update i don't like doing automatic windows updates i know microsoft wants to force you to do them but i like to say okay there's an update i'll install it now that way when the computer reboots you know if there's a problem that's what caused it but with the automatic updates it just kicks in overnight and i come and i sit down and not only is my computer rebooted but now it's not working too so now i don't have any clue what happened i assumed it was a, a windows update which i did I rolled back the update and uh, you got to go into safe mode and a whole bunch of stuff. If you guys want to see the instructions on how to do that, let me know. I'll make a video about it. But uh, it was a pain and uh, it took me a couple hours this morning to butts with it and do this. And of course, then it threw my whole day off. But uh, yeah, more to come. Uh, what's today? Friday the 17th. Happy St. Patrick Stewart's Day. And um, I got a lot planned for next week. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll kick it off on Monday. Maybe, maybe some stuff over the weekend if I get some... I got my moving finished. There's still stuff at the old house. It's a pain. Okay, folks, live long and prosper. I'll see you next week. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up and post any comments you may have. I do try to read and answer all of them as soon as I can. Make sure you subscribe to my channel, which is completely free, and click on the bell icon to select all to receive notifications when new videos are posted. Make sure you click the show more link down below the video to find additional resources and links. You'll see a list of other videos, additional information related to the current topic, free lessons, and lots more. YouTube no longer sends out email notifications when new videos are posted, so if you'd like to get an email every time I post a video, click on the link to join my mailing list. Even if you don't want to become a member, feel free to donate to my tip jar. Your patronage is greatly appreciated and will help keep these free videos coming. I got puppies to feed. How do you become a member? Click on the join button below the video. After you click the join button, you'll see a list of all the different membership levels that are available, each with its own special perks. Silver members and up will get access to all of my extended cut tech help videos, one free beginner class each month, and more.
Gold members get access to download all of the sample databases that I build in my Tech Help videos, plus my Code Vault, where I keep tons of different functions that I use. You'll also get a higher priority if you decide to submit any Tech Help questions to me, and you'll get one free expert class each month after you finish the beginner series. Platinum members get all the previous perks, plus even higher priority for Tech Help questions, access to all of my full beginner courses for every subject, and one free developer class each month after you finish the expert classes. These are the full length courses found on my website, not just for access to. I also teach Word, Excel, Visual Basic, and lots more. You can now become a diamond sponsor and have your name or company name listed on a sponsors page that will be shown in each video as long as you're a sponsor. You'll get a shout out in the video and a link to your website or product in the text below the video and on my website. But don't worry, these free tech help videos are going to keep coming. As long as you keep watching them, I'll keep making more and they'll always be free. Now, if you have not yet tried my free Access Level 1 course, check it out now. It covers all the basics of Microsoft Access. It's over four hours long, and I just updated it for 2021. You can find it on my website or on my YouTube channel. I'll include a link below that you can click on. And also, if you like Level 1, Level 2 is just $1. Yep, that's all, $1, and it's free for all members of my YouTube channel at any level, even supporters. Want to have your question answered in a video just like this one? Visit my tech help page on my website, and you can send me your question there. While you're on my site, feel free to stop by the Access Forum. Lots of good conversations happening there. Be sure to follow my blog, find me on Twitter, and of course, YouTube. Once again, my name is Richard Ross. Thank you for watching this tech help video brought to you by AccessLearningZone.com. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you learned something today. I'll see you again soon.